New Year's Eve in London's Trafalgar Square and the frolics that traditionally go towards greeting the coming year. To look at revelry like this, you'd think 1979 was something Britons were looking forward to. Actually, the outlook was decidedly grim, and you didn't need a crystal ball to predict the strain that was likely to be put on the state of the nation. The weather itself seemed symbolic of the bleakness that was about to grip Britain, chilling even that famous British optimism. For the closing months of 78 had seen industrial unrest stirring like a lazy monster. Few doubted that 79 would see that monster unleash itself in a battle between trade unions and government. That's now happened in a power struggle that's plunged the country into its toughest crisis since the general strike of 1926 and plagued the daily life of every sector of the population. With the worst weather conditions for over 30 years, it looked the proverbial winter of discontent. And Britons weren't reassured to learn that while they shivered, Prime Minister James Callaghan was in the peaceful, sunny Caribbean, attending a Western summit in Guadeloupe. Britain's invitation to the summit was proof that the country still rates a place on the world stage. But thousands of miles from Guadeloupe, problems awaited Callaghan. Several major employers had made wage settlements with their workers to avoid damaging strikes. And those settlements had far exceeded the 5% guidelines laid down by the Callaghan government to avert a pay explosion and a fresh onset of inflation. The government's pay policy had been breached and nothing stood in the way of a wages scramble that would spell widespread industrial disruption and a political showdown. Mr. Callaghan said he could see no crisis, but was later to eat his words. Tanker drivers were the first strikers to take advantage of a defeat in the House of Commons that had left the government powerless to enforce its pay policy. Until that defeat, the government had been able to impose sanctions on any company awarding pay rises substantially above 5%. With the government disarmed, though, some employers paid up rather than suffer a protracted strike. Of course, they didn't give in without a struggle. There was a stoppage by the tanker men before they settled. Gasoline supplies dried up, motorists stopped in their tracks, but the drivers netted three times more than the government limit. Some imports and exports were stranded at dockyards because trucks didn't have the fuel to move them. But if the tanker driver's dispute slowed Britain down, another strike, hard on its heels, was to bring the country almost to a standstill. Encouraged by the triumph of the tanker drivers, 50,000 other truck drivers launched a similar campaign. They wanted a shorter working week and demanded a pay rise of over 20%, blockading factories to get it. The strike was to damage the economy and have wide political impact. In Britain, picketing is perfectly legal. A striker has the right to stop other workers from strike breaking as long as he does so only long enough to explain the reason for the strike and to try to peacefully persuade fellow trade unionists to cooperate. During this stoppage, truck drivers went a good deal further, physically blocking deliveries. It meant that manufacturers went short of raw materials, products couldn't leave factories, and again, imports and exports were marooned. These vehicles are not a hire reward, they're allowed through. Any vehicle not on hire reward, we won't allow through. We're a hire reward drivers on strike out here. That means basic pay for £65 a week. The truck driver's strike highlighted a relatively new phenomenon in industrial relations, one quite illegal in many other countries. In Britain, it's become known as secondary picketing, a tactic practiced by the better organized, more militant unions. Simply, it means picketing firms not directly involved in the striker's dispute. It's been condemned as industrial blackmail and immoral. That's a matter of opinion. But secondary picketing does penalize firms who aren't even in conflict with the strikers. 
the lorry drivers were actually in dispute with the Road Hauliers Association. But all kinds of companies up and down the country lost out as mobile bands of pickets went from factory to factory, stopping all forms of transport. The dispute was to prove how crippling a single union can be when it's determined. And the truck drivers certainly went for victory at any price. The people who work here, in fact, are not involved in the dispute. So why are you picketing here? Well, it's the secondary picket. It's uh, all we're doing. It's just trying to keep drivers in, stop drivers from working. You know, we only drivers, so it's the same as what they are. So you, you say it's as the only way to, to make the strike effective? Yes, you say? yeah, definitely. Is it fair, though, to get involved with a firm that aren't directly involved in the dispute? Well, we'll let anything out that's uh, essential. Anything that isn't essential just stays in. You know, if somebody comes up for a load that's essential, well, then we'll let it out. But uh, other than that, we don't. But you're deciding that? Well, the union's deciding it. The strike and the picketing meant that deliveries to shops and supermarkets were also hit. The situation improved after a High Court ruling late in January that secondary picketing was illegal. But for several days, there was a period of panic buying, with staple commodities like butter, salt and sugar disappearing from the shelves. The pressures of supply and demand pushed up the prices of vegetables, and there were warnings that food rationing might have to be introduced. This never happened, mainly because the truck driver's strike did not become an official national strike, and also because many big supermarket chains employ their own drivers. But for a time, there was panic in the air, as one store manager explained. There's been a, there's been a terrific rush to the shops this morning, and there's no doubt about it, the average purchase in our stores has gone up perhaps by 50%. We've sold probably 50% more than we would do on a normal Friday. And what's the outlook for the future? The future is serious if we don't have the lifting of pickets of uh, food manufacturers, cold stores, and the general chain of food distribution. We have had some move today. Some pickets have come off uh, food distribution points. But at the same time, other uh, food uh, manufacturers and food distributors have had a strike spread. And the feeding people was fairly easy, but feeding Britain's animals certainly wasn't. Cows, for example, can exist on basic fodder, but they need a specialised diet to produce good milk. Shortage of animal feed soon had farmers all over the country warning of a real disaster. The unions agreed they were a special case, though there were difficulties actually getting that message through to the pickets. It was touch and go over these battery hens. In the end, they avoided a premature conversion to frozen chickens and were able to continue their egg-laying careers. Britons wanting to read about the crisis found their newspapers too were suffering. The national dailies got slimmer and slimmer as the deliveries of newsprint slowed down. It was the kind of situation Britain's best known newspaper, The Times, might have thundered about but it couldn't actually say anything. A separate labour dispute closed it down completely at the beginning of the year. Such then was the cumulative effect of the truck driver's strike. It wasn't settled until the end of the month, when agreements were reached with the employers region by region. The drivers accepted a basic weekly wage of 64 pounds sterling, only one pound less than they'd wanted, and representing an increase of 21% well above the government guidelines. The strike cost the country's economy an estimated 20 million pounds and resulted in at least 100,000 workers being laid off. But the government's main concern was that other unions would seek similar wage rises, fueling inflation and devaluing money. That's the government's main argument, and it was put forcibly by the minister in charge of prices, Roy Hattersley. The idea that a wage is free for all, and only a wage is free for all, protects the living standards of this country, has been demonstrated to be absolutely false. 
Last year, when Labour planned wages, at least planned them to a degree, we were so successful in holding down the inflation rate that our national standard of living rose by eight pence in the pound. That was an increase in real earnings, increase in what our wages will actually buy. And success of the same sort can be achieved, but can only be achieved if we continue the policies that made the success of last year possible. What is not possible, and I base my example on the wage claim now being made in the road haulage industry, is an overall increase in real wages for all the country of something like 15 or 20 percent. The country is not 15 or 20 percent more wealthy than it was last year. And there is no way in which we can vote, strike or picket ourselves into a growth in real earnings of that size. If everybody obtained that increase, that paper increase, the net result would be inflation taking off again and a cut in living standards, not an improvement. That message cuts no ice with Britain's poorer paid workers who've been left behind in the pay race. Among them, ambulance men. Britain's ambulance drivers were the third major group to take action in January. In London, a strike by 2,300 ambulance men closed down for a day the world's largest single emergency service. At first, they threatened to ignore emergency calls, even if it meant that lives would be lost, a threat that was actually carried out elsewhere, though not in London, and with no loss of life. Could you know before we pan away, answer that question? I'd like to say to you that there are negotiations going on. Sort of negotiations, o answer the question. Officer, Don't be a politician. Officer, officer answer the question. Now you're going to show it to the other yeah, right. right. Despite being faced simultaneously with the truck driver strike and that of the ambulance men, the government refused to declare a state of emergency. Even so, they set up regional emergency committees to coordinate that movement of essential supplies and services. But no one promised they could adequately replace the strikers. The ambulance crews were asking for rises of over 26 pounds a week to give them 65, way above the government limit, but still little more than the national average for manual workers. Army ambulance crews joined volunteers to provide a standby service. Their task was a daunting one. Taking the capital as an example, on a weekday, normally 215 ambulances answer over 1,200 urgent calls. They carry 10,000 outpatients for hospital treatment, some, of course, needing skilled attention. It's a staggering burden, but it could be worse. The authorities were dreading a full-blown disaster. So were militant ambulance men. But as one put it, we're fed up with being Cinderella's. This time we're going to the ball. January was not to see a settlement for the ambulance men's claim. In fact, worse came when hospital ancillary workers began to take action. Apart from blocking supplies, they stopped cooking hospital meals, cleaning, laundering, and a host of equally essential services. The result? Over half Britain's 2,300 hospitals closed, except for emergencies. Mr. Reynolds, the health minister, visited hospitals and put a brave face on what everyone knew was a deteriorating situation. Nurses, too, are soon to begin action if their claim is not met for 25% more pay. At present, the average nurse gets around £50 a week. Meanwhile, operating theatres are idle, and patients have been sent home. Last week, you know the one we sent home yesterday? Yes. Could you make sure that the physio... Despite the amount of suffering these strikes have caused, there's still a tremendous reserve of public sympathy for the health service workers. It's generally held that they are underpaid, and the fact that they, of all people, have taken action on such a scale is a measure of their bitterness and disillusionment. If you're, if you're not cutting off essential services in the hospital, what's the thinking behind the action you've taken today? Really, we're making a statement to the government. We've, we feel that the government has for too long counted on us not uh, employing the ultimate sanction of strike action. We feel that they've sat back and said, well, the hospital workers will never strike because they've got this feeling of responsibility. Today, 
one and a half million public health, public sector workers from all over the country will be down picketing the House of Commons and lobbying their MPs. This is a definite statement. It's only the beginning. We just can't possibly continue the present arrangement whereby we get the dirty end of the stick every time. We've got to, in some way, prove that we're capable of doing it. Most of Britain's lowest paid workers are in the public sector. There are a million and a half in four unions. There had already been a one-day strike nationwide. Never before had they banded together to make such an impact. They followed up their token stoppage with a campaign of guerrilla strikes. Shortages of water were one inconvenience. Piles of rubbish were another outward sign. They also hit schools, airports, roadworks and many other essential services. The public servants planned it as a once and for all attempt to gain parity with workers in private industry. For the public sector is one whose pay the government can control. Because the government is the paymaster, it has held down wages in the public sector through successive years of pay legislation. But public service workers now aim to catch up and they claim they'd need a 35% rise to do it. To meet the cost would impose an impossible strain on the national budget. Equally important, it would start other workers desperately leapfrogging to preserve their traditional differentials over public workers. And already settlements during January are running three times higher than the 5% the government said the country could afford. But can the government afford not to pay while the country's most helpless people are the hardest hit? While the elderly are denied services such as hot meals at home? It seemed no one could escape the effects of this strike, not even the dead, since gravediggers and cemetery staff are public employees. They went on strike and bodies are literally piling up. In Liverpool alone, 300 have been stored, possibly for a mass emergency burial at sea. Public transport, a perennial source of labour dispute, was also plagued by strikes throughout January. On the railways, 24-hour nationwide stoppages were called on four separate dates by the train drivers' union, ASLEF. They were demanding bonus payments for driving high-speed trains, though they didn't have the backing of the two other rail unions. That's the typically British problem of employees in the same industry being represented by several unions. It all makes negotiations more difficult and strikes less avoidable. That means more damage to the economy and more inconvenience to the public. With the trains out of action, people turn to the buses. Unfortunately, they can't be relied on much either. The busmen have threatened to go on strike too. In the struggle to keep up with Britain's rising cost of living, Nobody wants to be left behind. The main roads into London are crowded during the rush hour at the best of times, but on several days during January, things were much worse. People coming into work were forced to use their own cars, and journeys of 20 miles were taking over four hours. It all meant a lot of wasted time, and a lot of frustrated, long-suffering commuters. To complicate the situation further, the worst of London's weather came at the same time as separate strikes by British Rail's southern region. Railway lines iced up. Special equipment was quickly brought in, but there was more disruption. The British people generally accept rail strikes with resignation. They've seen so many before. But they've been shocked by the bitterness of some of the other strikes and by the inevitable suffering to innocent people. Politically, all this anger could be bad news for the ruling Labour Party. And 1979 is an election year. The 
person who could take political advantage of the situation is the leader of the opposition Conservative Party, Margaret Thatcher. Speaking in Glasgow, Mrs Thatcher claimed almost the entire country was in agreement. Things had just gone too far. Mr Chairman, even the Prime Minister's concluded that our troubles are serious. A full, long, anxious week after he told us that it was unpatriotic to talk of mounting chaos. <clears throat> now, we didn't need telling of the crisis. In Scotland, you didn't need telling. You saw control passed to the pickets and the strike committees. You saw businessmen having to queue to the strike committees to get dispensation, to get their own goods, to move them into their own lorries, to carry on their own business or to fill the shelves in their own shops. You didn't need telling of a crisis as you saw men, some of whom didn't want to go on strike, afraid to cross the picket lines. You didn't need telling there was a crisis as you saw the sick and the elderly made the victims of heartless action. What sort of society is this which breeds such selfish callousness? The Labour government clearly saw the warning light and a series of meetings were held at the end of January between government ministers and leaders of the Trades Union Congress. Prime Minister Callaghan could call an early spring election and in that case there must be some kind of agreement to end the flood of union militancy over pay. The Labour Party's entire credibility is at stake and politically it can't afford to be in open conflict with the country's trade unions. That's why there was such urgency in the appeal for moderation to TUC members by Prices Minister Hattersley. We've grown to understand, some of us the hard way, that what's important in terms of wages and earnings is not the final figure at the end of the pay slip, but what the money in the pay packet will actually buy. And I believe this country is uh, populated these days by uh, housewives and uh, working men and women who've grown tired of paper increases which lose their value almost before the pay packet is opened. And I believe the message has got across that real earnings are more important than paper increases and that to get that sort of real earnings increase, wages like every other aspect of our economy have to be planned in some way. I believe that, that policy, the wages policy outlined in our white paper last July, was the right policy for this country. The wages target it included was the only figure which could produce an inflation rate acceptable in terms of unemployment, acceptable in terms of living standards, acceptable in terms of preserving the real purchasing power of the people of Great Britain, and produce it without the hardships and penalties of higher taxes higher interest rates, lower public expenditure, and greater unemployment. That target, or something very like it, can still be achieved. And I want to tell you today that the government intends to go on fighting for its attainment. Union leaders were also summoned to number 10 Downing Street for consultations with the Prime Minister. The present Labour government came to power in 1974 after the Conservatives' disastrous confrontation with militant mine workers. If government and unions can't agree now, the electorate might feel things couldn't be any worse under the Conservatives and might even be better. January then is a month most Britons would like to forget, though there's little chance that industrial and political events will allow them that luxury but it's by no means all over yet. Still to come are some of the potentially most disruptive confrontations. The power workers are yet to claim, so are plumbers and milkmen. The civil servants and teachers are all talking about big wage demands. Then there are the miners. They say they'll fight for a staggering 40% 
even though the coal board can only afford about 3%. So there could very easily be a repeat of the clash which brought down the Conservatives in 1974. Clearly, Callaghan's much vaunted special relationship with the unions must soon be seen to work. The workers of Britain will have to choose between high wage claims, which inflation and taxation would devalue, or forego cash in favour of support for a Labour government which claims it's dedicated to putting the country on its feet and giving it more social justice than the Conservatives can offer. If January's chaos proved one thing, it was that the time had come for the country's trade unions to make a decision. Do they value their relationship with the government highly enough to toe the line over pay? Or do they place their freedom to negotiate their wages ahead of their loyalty to the Labour government? If the answer is cash before commitment, the days of the Callaghan government are probably numbered. Okay, thank you. All right.